Uh, I'd like to welcome you here. I'm Walt Cooley, uh, the editor of, of Progressive Dairyman Magazine. And we'd like to thank you for coming to Progressive Dairyman's dairy seminars here at World Ag Expo. This is a topic on crossbreeding, so we hope you found the right, the right room. Um, we appreciate your attendance today. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors of all of the seminars here, uh, which happen at 11 and 1 during each day of the show. And those uh, sponsors are Beringel Ingelheim, De Laval, Diamond V, Mensch Manufacturing, Soy Best Pearl, and Virtus Nutrition. Today's uh, sponsor of this particular seminar is Mensch Manufacturing. And I'd like to turn a little bit of time over to Noah uh, Mensch for a few moments and comments. As Walt said, my name is Noah. I'm from uh, Mensch Manufacturing. We're a, a family based or family company based out of Hastings, Michigan. Um, it all started with my dad. He uh, started the company over 25 years ago when he designed and patented the first rubber tire manure scraper, which uh, I'm sure there's many of you here that are familiar with, maybe more familiar than you want to be. But uh, we've since diversified. We've got uh, several different pieces of bedding equipment that we now uh, we manufacture. And we've uh, proceeded along the, the manure handling lines where we have an expandable manure scraper and also to the manure vacuum now that uh, that we've been making. Things are going well. Uh, we've, we've branched off into a multinational company. And uh, we continue to expand and try to make the best equipment that we can. We appreciate your time, you guys coming here, and we appreciate all the support that we do get from you guys, both in uh, helping us to design better equipment and uh, telling us your concerns and where we should uh, maybe direct our attention to next. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Noah. So uh, I will now outline uh, today's seminar agenda and introduce our first presenter. Uh, the, the seminar will proceed as following. Um, we are grateful to have with us today Dr. Les Hansen from the University of Minnesota. And he will be uh, giving a presentation to us first. And that will last for about approximately 20 minutes or so. Uh, following that, we will invite uh, uh, our panel of dairy producers to uh, join us. And we'll introduce them when we get to that point. But uh, at this point, I'd uh, like to welcome Dr. Les Hansen from the University of Minnesota. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you today. I uh, flew in late last night from Minnesota. I taught my dairy cattle genetics course on campus at noon yesterday. And I've uh, got to be home uh, in the Twin Cities tomorrow to teach at 3 o'clock. But uh, it's fun to get away from the snow and ice uh, and come out to your lovely weather here in California. I've only got 20 minutes, so we're going to move ahead uh, pretty quickly with that uh, uh, narrow uh, period of time. It's a tough topic, crossbreeding, to cover in 20 minutes. So uh, there's going to be some shortcuts here. But with the panel discussion that follows, if you've got specific questions, we can probably follow up with it at that time. So next slide, please. The standard in recent history for dairy production has been the Holstein cow. Uh, most of you in the room are younger than I am. Uh, the truth is, of course, we haven't always had a black and white cow uh, as the standard for the dairy industry. When I grew up in southern Minnesota as a youth, uh, probably only half the cows were Holsteins. We had large populations of all the other major U.S. dairy breeds at that time. But as the years have gone by, uh, the world has moved more Holstein. I grew up with registered Holsteins. And uh, the, the herd I grew up with, we had the high production herd in the county. And of course, that Holstein cow, we all know that cow, we've been able to breed her to give milk. And over the past 40 years, a uh, big chunk of my lifetime, we've dramatically improved that production. A lot of its environment, however, it wasn't all due to genetics, but the Holstein cow uh, did respond to intensive selection for milk production. We dramatically improved the udders, and again, uh, most of you are too young to realize how bad the udders used to be in all of our dairy breeds. Again, we had the high production cow uh, herd in the county. We had our Holsteins trained. You, uh, tipped her on the back of the foot, she stepped forward so you could put on a plank so you could get her up on it so you could put that surge milker on. Because my goodness, if a cow was giving 650 pounds of fat, she had to have a deep udder. So uh, these are incredible things we've done through selection. Of course, all the breeds have made improvements in those areas. Another thing we've done with the Holstein, and I think this is a, a big one that's being docked about heavily, and I think here in California, the cow is just getting too big. And I look at these genomic proofs on these young bulls, and we're going to be making her a lot bigger. So keep making those stalls bigger, or cubicles, or whatever you've got, because we're not going to be slowing that down, even though there's a lot of lip service otherwise. And then the other thing uh, we've done is really take off body condition. 
And I laugh a bit because people say, well, this is because of the selection for milk production. But it's not only that. I coach the judging team at the University of Minnesota. Uh, knock on wood, we've won four of the last five contests we've been in. And I'll tell you, we have actively selected for dairy character on top of milk production. We don't want to milk a beef cow, right? We want her to be sharp. So two bull mothers, potential bull mothers, if one was sharper, she got to be the bull mother. Even if she was open, we'd flush embryos from her. The one that was fatter and pregnant, no, no, no. We, we don't like to look at, at, at uh, fat. So just a little background on why this topic has come up. Uh, this was the ideal Holstein cow in 77. They changed her uh, in 77. There had been a previous one in 22, 1922, that I grew up with, which was a much smaller and rounder cow. And they went this direction with the breed. And of course, uh, well, the things I'm pointing out, I, I was part of this. We all were. You know, we do things sometimes uh, thinking we're doing the right thing and it doesn't turn out that way. But we made her extravagantly large, long, sharp, uh, really a huge type cow. And Holstein USA last past year had the wisdom to tone her down and brought her down in the front end, uh, took, it down, took out that extreme depth of body, we know now that causes DAs. These shallower cows don't have all those DAs. We need an udder on a cow, uh, and we put some bark back on her, little body condition, so we can helpfully get her pregnant. So a little bit background there on the Holstein breed. Uh, wonderful breed of cow, but we probably did some things that weren't uh, totally the smart thing to do in hindsight. So uh, all of the livestock species other than dairy cattle have embraced heterosis or hybrid vigor, same terminology. Hybrid vigor, heterosis, the same thing. You, you aren't going to eat many pigs or eat much pork that's not from a crossbred pig. Almost all beef is crossbred, even if it says certified Angus. The lamb industry, hybrid corn, any production item you lose capitalizes on heterosis, but we've been timid about it in dairy cattle because we thought we had this Holstein cow that really could do it all. Uh, it turns out this heterosis in dairy cattle, which is equal and opposite in effect to inbreeding, depression within a breed, is expressed mostly for these traits. Now, if you look at that list of traits, those are the traits that drive you nuts, right? The cow fertility. You got it. Now we got to shoot all those hormones. Uh, we didn't have to do that, and we still had 50% pregnancy rate or 50% uh, conception rates if we go back uh, 30, 40 years. A stillborn calf. You know, that's 10% international now in Holsteins, uh, especially for first calvers. The health ruins your day. The mortality, dead cows, depends on the data set, but nationwide all herds were probably up at 8 to 10% of Holsteins. Die on the farm, you don't even get that salvage value that's so high. And then, of course, we're spinning generations pretty quickly. Now, these traits don't jump out at you in production statistics. You can't see it as far as their type but they sure can um, make your day good or bad depending on which direction you're going with them. They're, you go backwards with the inbreeding with inbreed, and you go positive with the heterosis across uh, breeds. Uh, and how this heterosis works, you've got two breeds, breed A, breed B. If breed A is at 24,000 pounds of milk, if breed B is 22,600 pounds of milk, if you cross those two breeds in that first cross, you should be intermediate between the two, but there, we think there's about 3% heterosis for the crosses of many of our breeds for production. And when you add on that extra 3% on top of the average of the two breeds, you can be up at the level of the 24,000. And I actually picked these two because it's about what Swedish Holsteins produce and Swedish red and white produce, so the Swedish red breed. And crossing those two breeds, you'd expect to be at about the same level for production. That's the way heterosis works. But for those traits that we talked about earlier on that list, the fertility, the health, the survival, the heterosis is much higher than 3%, probably at least 10%. So some results here from that study. These are the number of cows that we had uh, during first lactation across uh, these uh, dairies that we had in the study. Uh, the Holsteins, uh, prior to first milk recording, about 9% had left the herd. They didn't make it to first milk recording. And often that would be your catastrophe when the calving difficulty, that first calving, the metritis, you know, that spiral that happens and they, that you end up either dying, this includes death, or left. 
and 15.9% uh, had been called by the end of their first lactation. These are very typical for national data in the U.S. These are not unusual at all for pure Holsteins. If you look at the Montbellier Holstein crossbreds, you can see the dramatic reduction in culling before first milk recording. They come through that calving easier. And uh, only half as many had been culled by 305 days in milk. And then the Nordic red, and again here, this is a combination of Swedish red and Norwegian red. And it, ironically, the number of cows that were Swedish red sired and Norwegian red were exactly the same. It was, in, it was uncanny how they turned out to be the same number of cows. Okay, now for days open, again, I'm summarizing across uh, lactations. For all lactations, the days open was 148 for the pure Holsteins. This is across all the lactations, 148 days open from calving until they were uh, uh, pregnant with the next calf. Um, this fits national data pretty well. Again, national data in the U.S., it depends on which data set you're looking at, but I think that would be a pretty standard uh, uh, measure for Holsteins in the U.S. You can see the dramatic reduction in days open for these crossbreds. Any surprise here? The Monte crossbreds, 122 days open, and the Nordic red Holstein, 137. Any surprise there? No. This is right what you'd expect. This is old, old information. Uh, hybrid vigor is substantial for uh, fertility. Next, for somatic cell score, again, here in California, do, you do much better than we do in the Midwest. Uh, so across uh, lactations for the Holsteins, that were 121,000, pretty incredible here uh, for the younger cow ages. Uh, but again, the difference for these crossbreds, they were dramatically better for somatic cell score. Any surprise here? No. This is what you'd expect with heterosis or hybrid vigor, whichever you wish to call it. If we look at the production then, some would say, oh yeah, you're better for fertility in somatic cell, but you probably lost a ton of production. Um, we got the number of lactations up there. It turns out for fat plus protein, pounds. You can sell pounds, I think, solids out here, not the, the volume. Even though we tend to talk of pounds of milk per day, it's not really what you get paid for. It's the solids in the milk. The Holsteins, uh, 1,100 lactations on those cows, 1679 for pounds of fat plus protein, averaged across lactations. Now, these are 305-day lactations. That's the way we tend to look at production, right? A 305-day lactation. Uh, Got to keep in mind that fertility, the crossbreds calving again sooner, isn't it? You're getting your back into peak production quicker. So it's not the same thing as annual production. This, but this is what we use for genetic evaluation. The Montbellier crossbreds were 52 pounds less, only 3% less than the pure Holsteins. And the Nordic red, uh, similar, about 4% less. Now, uh, there's no question on the Montes, and we have reps here and people involved, those early Monty bulls that you used in these herds were not top bulls for production. They just were not. So, uh, and the Holsteins, these breeders had always paid quite uh, price, uh, heavy price for their Holstein semen. So it's always going to make a difference what genetic level you're talking with, about within a breed. So the production, was there a huge sacrifice there? Uh, no. Maybe just a touch on a 305-day lactational basis, which is different than a 12-month rolling herd average. If we look at the longevity, the pure Holsteins, 75% here. Uh, we're moving to three of the dairies that had adequate numbers to compare for survival across the dairies. We needed one at least 20 of each of the breed groups uh, for comparison, so that's why the numbers are a bit different. Uh, you'll see that 75% calved the second time pretty good, really, survival uh, for the Holsteins. 51% calved a third time, 29% calved a fourth time. But if you look at the differences for the Montbelliard and the Nordic Red Crosses, 89% of the, cro the Montes Cross calved a second time. 75% uh, of the Montbelliard Crosses calved a third time, which is the same as the Holsteins a second time. And uh, similar down in the Nordic Red Crosses, um, Again, the Swedish red and the Norwegian red are very similar. So dramatic improvement in longevity of the crosses compared to the pure Holsteins. Then if we look at lifetime production. Now on this, we had to cap it at four years because Brad Hines, the graduate student, at some point needed to graduate and get a life. So uh, we, capped, uh, we had to cap this off at four years after first calving, which is a you know, pretty good interval of time. So you saw the difference in survival of the crossbreds. So these, this actually favors the Holsteins because the crossbreds live longer. 
And you can see for the pounds of milk here on the Holstein 6198 for lifetime production, the Monte Crosses and the Nordic Red Crosses were statistically highly significantly greater. And if we look at the fat plus uh, protein, 21% greater lifetime production on the Monte Crosses and 16% greater lifetime production on the uh, Nordic Red Crosses. So again, a lot more production. Now, if we're going to compare that, though, uh, you're probably interested not in just lifetime production, per, per production per stall per day. You know, you've got so much capacity on your dairy as far as four cows. So this, isn't, this would probably tilt it more in favor of the crossbreds, uh, looking at just the lifetime production. So then we looked at profit, and I just don't have the time here to, to show you all the input variables that went into this, but uh, value of calves, salvage value, it was all included. The lifetime uh, profit uh, for the Holsteins was $4,312. Again, these are profitable dairies. Those Holsteins stayed in the herd, averaged 946 days after first calving. But you can see the crossbreds were much more profitable on a lifetime basis, but they did stay in the herd a lot more days to get that. And again, we need to look at opportunity cost, profit per cow per day or per stall per day or however you want to look at that. But uh, I got to see my Florida matting got off here. But it was a 50% higher lifetime profit on the Monte Crosses and 45% higher on the Nordic Red Crosses. If we do it on profit per day then, uh, 451 for the Holsteins. These dairies, we did not get the health data uniformly recorded. And I'm going to talk about a current study we have going on in Minnesota to finish out here. And in there, we're getting all of the health data uniformly recorded. And one of the key reasons people consider crossbreeding is to help in the health department, to have fewer vet costs and have a less uh, problem-prone cow. So the health costs are ignored here. So. All the uh, values we get our hands on, we included, but we did not have health costs. But you can see the profit per day was 20 th 23 cents higher for the Monte Crosses and 15 uh, cents higher uh, on a daily basis for the Nordic Red Crosses. And of course, that's every day that they're in the herd. You're capitalizing in that regard. This is the study that's currently going on in Minnesota. Um, we enlisted uh, 10 large dairies in Minnesota. Uh, seven of them are graduates of the University of Minnesota. Uh, I'd say quite good dairy producers. These are their averages. So they average 677 cows. Um, some are two-time day milking, some are three, but you would probably consider that pretty respectable production level. Uh, the fat, 985, protein, 822 in the somatic cell. A little high probably by California studies, but pretty good by Minnesota studies on the somatic cell. Days open, 132. So they were probably better than the national average for reproduction. Services per conception, 2.5. This was their pure Holsteins when they joined the study five years ago. Calving interval, 13.6. Of course, it's a little bit censured. It's the cows that are in the herd, so that is a little lower than probably what would be if you concluded the cows that uh, never got pregnant. Still birth rate, 7.6. Not bad for the Holstein breed. Death rate, about that 8% that I'm talking about. It's a lot of, lot of carcasses to get rid of in a year. And the turnover rate of cows, 34. So these are well-managed, pretty typical top Holstein herds, I, you know, I think most of you would say, and representative of um, the dairy industry uh, among the better managed ones in the US. So you say, why did they join the study? Uniformly, the reason was they wanted a more trouble-free cow. They didn't want to have all that intervention with the hormone treatments if they didn't need to. Um, and they didn't want as many cows in their hospital pens. They just wanted a more trouble-free cow. All of them had a small number of crossbred cows, and that's why they, seven of the 10 also volunteered for the study. They called me. Um, they had that small number of crossbreds, and why did they have a small number of crossbreds? Because they knew if you got a problem breeding pure Holstein cow, if you use a bull of another breed, you're, you might get her pregnant. So then you end up with a few crossbreds, and you get those small number of crossbreds, and it's like, oh my gosh, maybe there's something here. So it's kind of that backdoor approach is the way the crossbreeding has happened for a lot of dairies. Next slide. Uh, these are, oh, the formatting didn't translate with our versions of PowerPoint. I apologize here. They did, they did uh, on my computer. Um, this is the, the first results from the new study. Very preliminary. Only three of the dairies had data to contribute, so it's highly, highly preliminary. 
154 pure Holsteins, 131 Monte Crosses, 134. This one is just Swedish red, um, didn't include the Norwegian red. Uh, age at calving, 22.8. They calve them young. The Monte Cross is 22.7. And the Swedish Red Cross is 22.7 months of age at first calving. Uh, the milk pounds, this is actual 305 day production. Actual 305 day production, not mature equivalent. This is actual two year old production calving at the, that level. No significant difference at all. Essentially the same. If we look at the fat pounds, 902 for the pure Holsteins, 935 for the Monte Crosses, 935 for the Swedish Red Crosses. Significantly higher pounds of fat. Pounds of protein, 731 for the pure Holsteins, significantly higher. 766 for the Montes, higher, but not significantly slow with these numbers uh, for the protein. But if you add the fat and protein together, you see we got 4% greater solids, fat plus protein from the Monte Crosses and 3% for the Nordic, or excuse me, the Swedish red. Significant difference. Now in this study, um, a cooperator is Select Sires is working with us on it. They're using top bulls in all three of the breeds. You know, so it's not, you know, cut rate discount in one breed or you're pulling off the low end or something like that. We really are using the top bulls in all three breeds. And then uh, this is the same information except I added the fat uh, plus protein percent here because people want to talk about components. And you can, generally speaking, the components on these crossbreds are about 0.1 <coughs> to 0.15 higher. That's what you can expect as far as the components. So again, the volume really wasn't different. It was identical but we get more pounds of solids because of the higher components in the milk. So just uh, quickly going through a few uh, photos from one of the dairies. And of course, we, they just picked a random one. Uh, that's the way it always goes. That's the way the AI companies always do that too, right? They pick a random one out of the pack to photograph. This is uh, a Swedish red, a uh, daughter of Oerud, calved at a year, 10 months, actual production. Uh, another is a daughter of Sorby, capped at a year, 10 months, good production, 210, made 34,000 in their second lactation, 310 days. This is uh, Masalino, capped at a year, 10, 209, 308. She capped back a year, a month earlier, each year. Um, she's 39 days in progress with that third record, great production. Daughter of Micmac, capped at a year, 8, second calf, 208. First 200 days, she's got out 23,400, so she's going to make a poppin' good record. So uh, I guess the only thing these photos show, are they necessarily a bunch of ugly looking things? No, probably not. Uh, quite functional and certainly uh, 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 profitable and functional cows all the way around. These are the body traits on, from this new study, the body condition on the Holsteins. We were able to pick up a few more uh, cows and a requirement to have 20 of each of the breed groups in the herds. 3.15 for the Holsteins, significantly greater body condition on the crosses. That has got to help with the fertility. Stature, 5.4 for the Holsteins with nine being the tall. The crosses uh, uh, tended to be a touch smaller for the Monte, 3.9 for the Swedish Red. Reduces the cow size. Strength, 4.8. For the Holsteins, the Swedish Red were about identical. Uh, the Montes were stronger significantly. And then Rump Angle, same story, uh, similar for the Swedish Red Holsteins to the pure Holsteins. The Montes tended to have a bit more slope to the rump. These are a three generation cow family at the University of Minnesota. So these are our cows. I, working with this uh, uh, Micmac uh, Monte uh, Grand Dam, a dam, a pure Holstein. Uh, Gen X Bull Clover and the, uh, the, the daughter uh, is a Peters Lund who's due uh, with her fourth calf in two days. So this is our first three breed crossbred, the Grand Dam at the University of Minnesota. Um, maybe you could say uh, if they were all going to turn out that way, every three breed cross in your herd, it would be pretty incredible. She's a Monty out of a Hojo. Uh, we started with the Jersey. Um, crossbreeding like many people did. We have moved against, uh, away from that. I'm sure we'll talk about it in the panel discussion. She was uh, then bred to Holstein for a three breed rotation. Next slide. So this is her daughter. You'd guess she's a pure Holstein probably. Uh, uh, but she does have some hybrid vigor there because she has the Monty and the Jersey behind her. Good production. She was then bred to Swedish Red because we took the Jersey out and replaced it with Swedish Red. And this is the cow that's due here in a couple days. You can see her production record. Um, 
She's a pretty special cow for us, extremely attractive cow and, and a highly productive one, and the highest index cow in our herd right now, two time a day milking in our campus herd. Uh, the last piece of information, we did dry matter intake on our Monte crosses, both the two breed and the three breed compared to our pure Holsteins. Feed intakes are so expensive, and I know here in California, feed efficiency is a huge topic right now. Uh, but it's extraordinarily expensive to collect it. The first 150 days of first lactation, uh, we found no difference in production. It was identical for these three groups. Uh, and the feed intake did not differ either. If anything, some indication may be slightly less for the crossbreds uh, than the pure Holstein. So although those Monte crosses carried more body condition, we're just not picking up any uh, indication that they're necessarily consuming more feed to, to maintain or to put on that body weight. So uh, critical points on the crossbreeding would be it's, it's a mating system that complements genetic improvement uh, within breed. You still need to use best AI breeds. It's not an excuse to use natural service bulls or crappy low-end genetics. You get what you pay for here, essentially. You need to use top bulls. And this heterosis is a, is a bonus on top of what you're doing within the breeds. And I'm known for my, it's a gift from God. Why, why have the dairy industry been afraid to use it? And uh, production of the crossbreds today seems very similar to the pure Holsteins, and that people keep coming back. It was on Dairy Allegheny discussion recently. You're going to sacrifice all this production. We sure aren't seeing it. Uh, we haven't gotten any reduction at all in the University of Minnesota, our crosses to pure Holsteins, or the herds we're working with. Uh, they're superior to the pure Holsteins for fertility, health, and survival. But if you're going to go down this path road, we ro strongly recommend you pick three breeds and rotate them. Because if you rotate three breeds, you're going to be at 86% of full heterosis across time. If you flip-flop just two breeds, you're down at 67%, so about a 20% reduction on average each generation for heterosis. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. At this time, uh, we'll have Dr. Hansen uh, take his place up here at the panel, and then we'll uh, have the panel join him and uh, let them introduce themselves. And then we'll uh, take any questions uh, that you have for the panel themselves. So um, it's my pleasure now to introduce two of our panel members. Uh, we're grateful to have uh, two dairymen here with us today. Uh, Jake Durat from Lamora, California is here and has a thousand cow dairy. And he can talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing with their uh, dairy and their crossbreeding, and also Jack Hoekstra from Oakdale, California. So what I'd like to do uh, at this point is ask uh, Jake and Jack to both uh, describe uh, what they're doing, how long they've been doing crossbreeding, and uh, any uh, new developments that they're looking at. Jake, we'll start with you. Or Jack, sorry, thank you. Who do you want to start with? Sorry, uh, Jack, I've got a Jack and a Jake. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, would you start for us, please? Okay, yeah. Um, I guess I've been crossbreeding for a long time. It all started off with the Jersey Holstein crosses. And uh, back in the day, it was, uh, you, you know, on the Jersey Holstein, you had to protect them in type. Uh, the bull, for those that know Jersey, there was the Sooner and Duncan bulls back in uh, a long time ago. And a lot of milk out of those jerseys. But when you cross them with Holsteins, you got a lot of milk, and you would get a lot of blown udders if you didn't protect them in type. Uh, then we did uh, quite a bit of the Montbilliard Swedish Red Crossing. Um, seeding costs are expensive, so we haven't done much of that. Uh, little challenges along the way were, um, you know, Swedish Red, you get a calf that comes out, and it's black and white with black legs, and it's a Jersey cross, so the bull calf buyer comes around, and he thinks it's a Jersey cross, so you get a big fat zero and when bull calves are bringing a lot of money, or a steeply discounted, where it should be a great, great beef calf, but if you don't have the market to market it to. Um, I do separate all my crossbreds, um, and I did a little research prior to this. Um, the crossbreds are about, in our herd, are about 800 pounds less than the Holsteins. Butter fat, they're 10 pounds higher, and protein, they're six pounds less. So yeah, we don't see a lot of production um, decreases. I thought my jerseys were a little higher producing than they are, but they're, they're not. And of course, a smaller breed. Um, and then I guess what we're really going to now, um, quite a few of our cows are bred to Angus now. And the jerseys, um, we're about 10, 15% jerseys. On the cows, we're 100% sex semen or limousine. No conventional semen whatsoever 
on the jerseys anymore. I got tired of Jersey Bull Cavs, so we're looking for a, a different angle on that. Um, conception rates, you know, I looked all this up too. Um, the Holsteins are pretty much all those two-year-olds that we don't want to sell anymore because they're not worth anything. So days open, and our whole, so our Holstein string has grown because we haven't done as much crossbreeding and just beef tremendously because of the, you know, two-year-old value. I mean, the beef cow value versus what a, what you can sell a Springer for, we're just going to get rid of these older cows for no reason except that they're old. Um, we briefed a tremendous amount of dry cows. You know, six to seven months, your fourth calf coming up, you're not good enough to stay just because. Uh, but our days open on those is 135, and I thought that was kind of interesting because the crosses are staying in the herd a lot longer because they do perform well. And their days open was 126. Services per conception was right at 244 for the whole season to 242 on the crosses. And I thought I was a little disappointed in the crosses until I realized, yeah, we've got a tremendous amount of two-year-olds that have fallen into that Holstein bunch. Uh, it's still tough to beat the jerseys because their services per conception is 195 with only 102 days open. And that's with sex semen on sex semen or lemon on the cows. Um, we do like, um, I'm not big into the three breed cross. Um, our top relative value cow last year was sired by a Dutch Holstein bull and her dam was a three quarter jersey. So all the, and some of the best bulls, the best pure production bull that I've used in the last 10 years was a Dutch red bull called Lex. And I think I was one of the only idiots in the country to use them because he was three-quarter Holstein, one-quarter Montbilliard. And for just pure production out of those cows. Um, the other bull that we've gone back to using, and for those of you that know jerseys, there was the whole uh, debacle with the Olmsdale cow that was supposed to be Jersey, but she was part Holstein. Um, and her sons were the top Jersey bulls. Those cows have now calved in as two-year-olds, and we've gone back to using him as one of our sex semen bulls because they are tremendous producing cows. So I'm not big at, you know, the three breed thing. It's the quality of genetics that you put into it, and obviously this Olmsdale cow, there's a lot of us. The pure Jersey guys all pretty much gave up on them, but the, the commercial Jersey guys, um, there is... A little bit of hybrid vigor, maybe, but I think it's just the quality of genetics that goes into it. Okay, Jack. <laughs> I'm uh, Jack Hookshire from Oakdale, California, and um, we started this crossbreeding journey probably about 13 years ago. Um, we had milked a herd of pure Holsteins and also a herd of pure Jerseys, and uh, we started crossing back and forth just on the problem breeders and came up with a you know Holstein Jersey and and what do we do next? What breed do we use? So um, we actually looked at the Normandy breed out of France first, and um, that was back in probably 98, 99. And um, actually my father and another gentleman by the name of Willie Bilesmo actually went back to the Paris Ag Show to look at the Normandy. And uh, while they were there, they saw the, Mo it's a big show, it's a huge show. Actually, it's bigger than this even. So um, they saw the Montbilliard there, and they said, no, that's really kind of the cow that we would rather be milking. She was strong, deep, big-boned, uh, looked like she would produce quite a bit. So ended up importing semen out of France, um, got to know Stefan for the first time. Um, he's the um, representative from Copex of the Montbilliard breed. Started using that semen, and, you know, through the Internet, we discovered the... Um, um, Swedish red at the time, and actually the Norwegian red also, uh, got some of that semen in, and just started on this journey. And at the time, we thought we would use the, the Holstein, um, either the Montbilliard Swedish red, and we thought at the time we would need another U.S. breed to, to crossbreed with. And so we actually did use more um, brown Swiss for a while. Um, so we ended up, our herd became very crossbred, a um, lot of different genetics in it. Um, got introduced to Professor Les Hansen at the time. Um, did a study, 
and um, really enjoyed what we saw. You know, the reason we kind of started down this path back, you know, 13 years ago is we just weren't quite satisfied with the Holstein. Yeah, she gave a lot of milk, um, just maybe not satisfied with the problems that we were experiencing with her. Um, just thought, hey, if we could have an ideal cow, what would she look like or how would she perform? And it was basically, hey, she would give a lot of milk, have high components, um, or had a great health traits, trouble-free, um, a little bit more beef value to them. And so we just started looking at all these different breeds. And through the research and through everything else, we, we definitely saw the Montbilliard as, as coming to the cream of the crop and the Swedish Red. Um, and so now we do just use the Holstein Montbilliard Swedish Red. We have used some Red Dane, although now with Viking genetics, the Red Dane, the Swedish Red, it's all going to become the same same breed here pretty soon. Um, so we've, we've basically stuck with the three breeds. Um, and that's because of the results. You know, it's pretty tough to to go back to Holstein now. I, there's just no way I would. Um, as a commercial dairyman, when you have all these extra benefits, it's all money in your pocket. When you have less health problems, when your breeding's better, when your feet and legs are so much better, um, you you get more for your beef cows, more for your beef your calves now. Um, we've developed a great market for our. our um, our young steers, um, they're highly sought after now. Um, it's just a win-win for the commercial dairyman. And uh, I, I think going forward, you know, we love what we're seeing. We're actually now, we're, we're breeding, we're in our fourth, fifth generation on some of these crosses. Um, back with Holstein, actually back with Montbilliard even. And we're seeing tremendous results. You know, our, our tank average, we average 80 pounds of milk now with a 3.8 fat and a 3.5 protein. We ship to a Hillmar cheese, so we get paid a pretty good bonus right now for our, for our milk. Um, for volume, you know, you, you get that kind of component, components with that volume. Um, it does make a big difference in your milk check. Um, and just all the other health benefits are, you know, yeah, our, our, our um, calving or our um, coal rate is 41 percent, but that's basically because we can't grow on the dairy that we're at right now. We're milking about 1250 milking, um, but we have 1700 young stock. Um, that's without using sex semen. Um, we're having to sell heifers and cows every year. Um, it's just worked very, very well for us, and um, really, really happy with it. Okay, at this point, uh, we'll take any questions that you might have for the panel, and uh, I'll go ahead and pass this mic around so that we can uh, hear the questions in the, in the entire room, and you can direct your questions to any of the panel participants, and if you keep your questions as short as possible, that would help permit. We have about 15 minutes of, uh, of public time for question and answer. Uh, anyone have any questions for our distinguished panel? Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Charles Goubeau from Canada. Uh, Dr. Hansen, I'd like to commend you for the excellent work you're doing for many years now on this uh, crossbreeding program. Um, you, you mentioned vet cost, and, and sure, it's, it's a very important factor. Uh, and you briefly mentioned feeding, but I think now feeding is becoming one of the major costs on, on most dairies. Um, how, do, how would you see that in the future? You see a kind of a an applied feed cost, uh, you know, research program, because I think that would, and maybe also on the quality of feed, can we feed those cattle with uh, less sophisticated and expensive feeds than, uh, than we're now using? Uh, you're right, feed cost is important, especially with the current prices, uh, and uh, probably that isn't going to change short term. Uh, the problem is to get the data is so extraordinarily expensive, and so uh, I just don't see how we're going to be ever to able to collect that. Now, there is a huge study going on, federally funded. Uh, Iowa State uh, and a few other universities are heavily involved uh, in a feed intake study, and they are using Kalen Gates to get the f individual feed intakes. Our hope on that is that we can tie it with other traits. What is the feed intake? How is it related to all the other traits? And getting a better handle on that. But to just to measure it directly is a huge problem. 
Now, uh, as far as feed efficiency then, feed intake um, from the other livestock species, there is not a lot of heterosis for feed efficiency, but at least it's in the right direction. So a crossbred should be somewhat more feed efficient than a, than a pure animal. Um, and it seems like across all of these studies, uh, hojos, whatever crosses you've got, they carry more body condition. And that seems to be a huge uh, gift for health and fertility. Uh, without any indication, they're consuming more feed. Um, from our studies, uh, we have done the feed intake on our hojos as well as our monies. We're not seeing any greater feed intake to have identical production, but more body condition. And of course, that body condition could come a little handy at call time as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, wish I could provide more. We've, I, from the, actually, from the very beginning, we did notice um, some feed efficiency in our crossbreds, especially um, early on, because they were our heifers were raised at a um, heifer facility or feedlot, and we saw a 10% um, increase in weight gains. Or actually, yeah. Actually, what we saw, we had to cut them back by 10% of feed to keep them from gaining too quick. We're after a 2.2 point or 2.2 pound um, average daily gain. They were gaining two and a half on the same feed that we were traditionally feeding to a straight Holstein. So we actually did have to cut them back. Um, on our milk cows, you know, we're after production. Uh, we do feed our cows well, very well, good feed. Um, they convert very well. Um, like our high cows are at 61 pounds of dry matter intake, but they are producing about 115 pounds of milk. So um, I th I th there's a definite benefit to feeding them well and to getting the production. They are excellent grazers. We do have pasture. Actually, I have, I have some heifers out in the hills right now on the green grass. So it's it they do very very well on pasture. Um, especially the Montmeliard tends to carry a little bit more flesh even on pasture. So. That's our experience. Uh, Jack, hi, I'm Carlos. I'm sorry about my English. I'll try to do my best. Um, I'm here with a group from dairy farmers from Portugal. Some of them uh, have a question for one of them. The people like you that you are on the crossbreeding for the last years, do you feel that your cows have any problems with them? Uh, uh, they are more rude. They kicking more on the barn. They are more. Uh, uh, Difficult to manage. Second question is about sucking on uh, on um, heifers. And uh, third question is about uh, leaving the milk out on the on the barn. If they need to do some shots to leave the milk inside the barn, or have, you, have you any any experience on this or not? Um, on the first one, as to temperament, I ours are definitely a lot calmer. They're an easy, docile animal um, to move around in the pens. Um, it, they're, they're a joy to work with, even chalking cows, very, very, very seldom does the vet ever get kicked on our dairy, and he'll tell you that, uh, very rare. Um, I think your second question had to do with sucking. Um, there's, a, there's an issue with the Montbilliard, I think, on, on early, early uh, sucking after they're weaned. Uh, we do tend to put in a few more... Um, little rings on their noses to keep them from sucking. There is that issue. Um, and what was your third question? Oh, milk letdown. Oh, milk letdown. It really, that's a non-issue. We, we never give an oxytocin shot, if that's what you're referring to. But um, I think as long as you have a good prep routine, get good stimulation, um, it's not a problem at all for us. See, I think in my experience, and I don't know, uh, the Swedish Red, the Monts are super easy going, and the Swedish Reds tend to be, uh, at least when you're vaccinating them every and everything, they're the ones that'll beller or um, fight you a little bit. So I've had a little bit more issue with Swedish Reds maybe than the Montbilliards. Oh, uh, something came up. You know, the both breeds have a temperament um, evaluation in there, and and I would say the Montbilliard. It, you might see within bulls a little bit difference. I know Micmac maybe been a little bit higher strung than, than some of the other ones, but overall, they're the, especially the Montbilliard, it's very docile, very rem, um, reminds me of a brown Swiss, just kind of easy going, not in a hurry, so they do well. Just tack on, uh, Carlos, uh, one thing I think we have to be very careful on, all these testimonials for dairy farmers, typically, they got one cow or two from a breed combination that irritates the heck out of them, and they don't forget it. 
So that one or two that's bad can ruin it for the whole group. So I just don't think we've got very good data on uh, many of these things. And that would be one additional take home message. I know Jake had a, one particular cow he's fond of, and we all do. You could tell my cow up there that I was fond of, that Swedish red. Yeah, I flushed him embryos out of her too. So uh, I played a little bit. Uh, it's fun to have a little fun on the side. But uh, we need large numbers of cows. And like this new study we're working on, we're going to have thousands of all the breed types because uh, that's the way our minds work. One or two can really influence our decisions or our observations. I got something to add to that. We uh, ship to Hillmar, so there's, we do have to go through special training. Um, we all are past the farm program, which has to do with an animal husbandry, beef quality. And one of the things is on there is, is temperament of cows. And we scored the highest among all 200 dairy farms in Hillmar Cheese for, for cow temperament. So that should tell you that they're not. I know that early on, the Swedish red, you know, that was one of the things, be all they're skittish, this and that. It's, for us, it's not true at all. Just two questions, I guess. Uh, one, when you're paying attention to some of the type traits, do you find that the, the information you get is, is rational compared to what the type traits are in Holsteins? And the other thing is, is there, is there a market for crossbred heifers? Um, judging from the last few sales, the, the crossbred market is definitely better than it. You know, that always was the place to go to get cheap cows is buy Jersey Holstein crosses because they were a dime a dozen. and you know, but then you're, what you're picking up is uh, cleanup, you know, guys that throw Jersey bulls in with Holstein heifers to clean up or whatever. Um, you know, as far as Swedish red, it's a different qu kind of udder, maybe not the exact shape, but I think quite a bit better quality. Uh, and in Montbilliards, it kind of depends on the bulls because we've used some that got a lot of milk, but boy, that udder would get deep pretty quick. So it's, type is definitely important, I think, uh, on, and in other traits on selecting bulls. I, I would say the traits have worked well for us, and they're functional. Um, we're real happy with our cows. Um, we have, I think we have good udders on, in our herd overall. And the fact that we have so many heifers, we're fortunate we can call out what we don't like. And we're still having the, the Jersey udder influence in our herd to a point um, and somewhat of the Normandy influence somewhat too. Um, I, I think the, the, the way they select for the bulls in, in Europe, I think is tremendous in that the, so much emphasis is put on the health traits, um, less on production. Um, I think we are able to get this much milk out of these, these European breeds just because of the environment that they're in in Europe. A lot of them are pastured in the summer um, which would decrease their overall milk production. I kind of tend to say we get a compens compensatory milk production here in California just because of our, the way we manage our cows and the way we feed them. There's more milk behind these, these European breeds than what I think is on paper. I think this, the questioner uh, brought up something with Holstein, essentially a problem for the Holstein breed. I shouldn't say it's a problem for the breed, but an issue is that uh, they're all scored the first time. But if that other blows, they're never scored a second time. It's only voluntary. So for our study, Select Sires is scoring all of them every lactation. And I think we don't maybe, maybe we're selected for too shallow of an udder. In some of our Holsteins, they're not getting milk twice, uh, three times a day, that udder can blow. The other thing, um, the, uh, now that we're getting rid of the Jersey influence in our campus herd, the udders are dramatically influence, uh, improving. So those Montes might have been out of a Jersey uh, uh, dam. The Jersey, it's a wonderful pure breed of cow. I love the Jersey breed, but boy, sh that little cow wants to milk and that udder has a hard time uh, taking it. And of course, uh, Jake did a nice job of bringing up all the problems on the beef side of the industry when you've got Jersey in the mix. Dr. Hanson, I just have one uh, question for you, if you could Explain for me uh, what you would hope when your research study is done, if there's any uh, things that you would hope that would, the main things you would hope that would help the industry when the study's finally complete. Well, of course, we're just trying, like all the land-grant universities, to, to find answers for dairy farmers. Again, um, we didn't start this initiative. Um, uh, the dairy producers were uh, way ahead of the universities on the topic of crossbreeding, and I, I took a trip out to, here to California, and 
Um, I stopped by uh, the Hookstra Dairy and the Bowsma Dairy, and they asked me, would you want to look at our data? And I thought, well, I suppose, why not? And who would have ever thunk uh, what came out of that? So I kind of fell into it. Uh, I'd, I'd been pure Holstein my whole life. But as far as the impact, again, is just to answer questions. Uh, it's pretty obvious with the genomics, if you look at the pedigrees of the young bulls and the PTAs of all those young Holstein bulls, we're going to be making the Holstein cow a lot bigger, like I mentioned earlier. We're going to make her a lot sharper, and my gosh, are we going to make her more inbred. Uh, you look at those pedigrees, it's overwhelmingly Shottle, Goldwyn, uh, Old Man, and Planet. Uh, so if you're just randomly putting semen in your Holstein cows, uh, you're going to have some pretty heavy doses of inbreeding in those uh, embryos, and the first thing you expect with inbreeding depression is what? The embryo doesn't survive. That's the first way you're going to get inbreeding depression. So these cows might actually be, con be conceiving, but then the embryo slough because it's got enzyme deficiencies. So Walt, I, I don't know. We're, we're, well, we don't have a goal. We're just trying to answer questions. Well, it's been going up. The inbreeding coefficient's been going up 0.1% per year. So Holstein's born last year in the U.S. that are in the data file. They've got to make the data, data edits, so this is probably better on average is 5.9%. And for livestock, we've always said, not a firm number, but it probably shouldn't get above about 6.25. And Holstein's going up 0.1, and that's likely going to accelerate. So I think it, we probably will need an option for dairy producers who don't have good pedigree information. The Jersey breed, they know, they've known that for years with Duncan and Sooner. Uh, as Jake mentioned, they have two bulls that make up 40% of the gene pool. But so they got, they got saved by the Danish. Yeah, and that's short term. It's really helped, but they plateaued at seven percent. But they look at their pedigrees. Most Jersey producers use Jersey mate or one thing or another. So I think you can do that with Holstein. Another option. Uh, Some of you familiar with Select Sires has introduced their stratagem. We've got inbred lines of Holsteins that you can cross. So there, there's other ways of doing things. But that inbreeding, I think, is going to be a, a huge issue. But there's no magic number to answer your question. Right. I'd, I'd like uh, to. Thank our panel and uh, hope that you uh, would thank them as well. Let's give them a round of applause.